Hare Krishna, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in this uh, QA session on uh, feel good, feel bad, and how spirituality connects in feeling good and feeling bad. So first of all, I would like to introduce the panelists. If you can all quickly say a couple of sentences about yourself, we can start from there. So Jitendra Prabhu, can you please? Sure, answer? yeah. So I am uh, I'm originally from uh, India, that is, uh, uh, Solapur, which is near Pune, and I got connected to this process uh, in Pune uh, during my undergraduate studies. And currently, I'm uh, based in uh, USA, Jersey City, New Jersey, and uh, I work as a software engineer. Thank you. Tiffany. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, would you like to go ahead? Okay. Hi, Krishna. Yes, um, my name is Tiffany, and what say? Um, I am an energy worker and a yoga instructor and a mother of three and I've been practicing Krishna consciousness for about five years now. So, thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a lover of philosophy. Uh, I am so excited to be here. One of my favorite speakers is Chaitanya Term Prabhu himself. I learned so much. I always have so many endless questions, uh, but he is one of the best. And I have been practicing bhakti for about four years now and trying to drink of as much nectar as possible. Just like Tiffany, I'm also a yoga and meditation teacher and, uh, and energy healer here in New York City. Thank you, Athena. So let's dive into the topic. The topic is actually very interesting because it talks about dichotomies in the path of bhakti. And I've always faced this in my own life. So it's about feeling good and feeling bad. When do we tolerate? When do we retaliate? We are always told about being humble. If you look at our more recent acharyas, it's all about humility. But if you look at the Mahabharata, Arjuna and Hanuman, they actually retaliated. So when should we do it? When should we retaliate? When should we tolerate? So let's start by asking some questions on humility. So this QA session will be categorized into two sections. The first section will be on humility, and the second section will focus on practical applications on feeling good and feeling bad. So let's start with uh, Jitendra Prabhu. You can start your first question on humility. Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, when we talk about humility, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is a verse in uh, Shikshashtakam, right? You should be humbler than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, uh, you know, devoid of all false prestige and always ready to give respect to others. So I had a question regarding this, especially I am in the, I, I work in the corporate space. So if, if this is taken literally and I'm always humble, then there is a risk of being trampled upon by others, right? And uh, also, I just wanted to understand whether this, uh, these four uh, instructions which this verse talks about, being humbler than a blade of grass, tolerant than a tree, uh, not expecting any respect and ready to give all respect to others, are these compartmentalized within themselves or is there an overlap and connection between them or is humility an umbrella uh, quality which... Uh, encompasses all of the other three. So, if uh, Prabhuji could shed light on that. Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, thank you for asking it. So, two things with respect to humility. In general, any virtue you know, which we hear about in scripture or even in, in tradition at large, there is our conception of what that virtue means. And there is the tradition's depiction of that virtue in action. So we all come with particular conception, like humility means that we will be, as you said, trampled over. That's our conception. And now if you look in the tradition, the, has that happened? To those who are humble. Yes, at one level, we could say that sometimes, which for example, Haridas Thakur was beaten and he did not retaliate. But that itself is not given as an example of humility. That is given more as an example of forgiveness. 
Now we do see that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu exhibited humility in his dealings with uh, the impersonalist that he enco- encountered. That with <clears throat> with Sarvam Home Bhattacharya, he referred to him as a venerable elder like his father. With Prakashanand Saraswati, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sat at a lower place while all the Advaitic sannyasis were sitting at a higher place. And they themselves uh, invited him to come and sit with them. So he did exhibit that humility in the sense of uh, a culture of respectfulness. But at the same time, when it came to philosophy, he did not in the name of humility accept philosophical viewpoints that were contrary to the conclusion of the scriptures. In fact, he quite strongly opposed them. So, in my understanding, humility is more about personal conduct, not so much about so humility is reflected in our personal conduct but humility doesn't mean that we undermine the purpose that we are meant to serve the service that we are going to do so if we have a responsibility and if that responsibility requires us to be assertive in certain areas we don't hesitate to do that so, so, so that means there are two distinct things. One is in personal conduct while dealing with others. We, if we, we are respectful, that is indicative of humility. But, so you, but humility doesn't mean that uh, we become like a, like a twig in a storm and get, let ourselves get swept away or become like a dish rag which is used and abused and discarded by people. Humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. So we have a certain purpose. And ideally, if we are practicing spiritual life, then we have a higher purpose of serving Krishna. And whether we do a particular service or not, doesn't depend on whether we are respected or disrespected. It depends on how we can move forward. And if somebody is opposing or obstructing a particular service, then we may have to do the needful to continue that service. And if that involves uh, sometimes challenging the other person, that is, that is what is required. So we can say that humility is more a matter of, uh, more, as I said earlier, a matter of personal conduct. It's not a matter of uh, purposeless or spinelessness. And uh, Beyond that, with respect to the four uh, elements of humility, I would say this is a matter of analysis. What is the way in which they interrelate? Humbler than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, uh, to respect others and not expecting respect for oneself. So these are, now how do we analyze them? I would say depending on the, the f- frame that a particular person might take, we could say that, this is just one way of looking at it. I'll say that in different ways. But humbler than a blade of grass, that is an example for, uh, for, uh, for basically for humility. And then, as I said, tolerance like a tree. Now that is, is an example for tolerance as it literally said. Now what, what I mean by this is that although we say the verse is about humility, the verse itself talks about two things, humility and tolerance. And the next part is about respect. So respect is, you could say, about how we give respect and how we seek respect. So we could say these are all four distinct things if you want to go that way. But we can also say that these are referring to one virtue. So if we want to be humbler than a blade of grass, now how do we do that? So we could say that humility is manifested through the other three things that we tolerate. Mm-hmm. And a tree is said to have a, 
uh, enduring as well as a giving nature enduring means not lasting but tolerating or not being uh, not being reactive and as well as giving a tree gives shelter a tree gives fruits like that so so humility is ex could be said to be exhibited through tolerance it is also exhibited through one's being re not seeking respect for oneself and one's giving respect to others that's one way of looking we could say all four are distinct and we could say the first is illustrated in the next three the next another way of looking at it could be that that humility and tolerance uh, ultimately how do we know that somebody is humble these are not uh, isolated virtues these are behavioral virtues that we know humility and tolerance only when a person is subjected to particular situations where others where normal reaction might be not so humble or so tolerant so if that is the case then we can say that amani that not expecting respect from others is an evidence of humility and tolerance means that i offer respect to others irrespective of how they behave with me that means the other my behavior is not necessarily a one to one response reaction to their behavior of course we consider other person's behavior but that doesn't mean that alone determines so if somebody insults me that doesn't mean i have to necessarily insult them that can vary from person to person but the idea is we see them as human beings who are parts of god and at that level we offer them respect specifically this is depending on how they are behaving we may respond appropriately but there is a basic level of respectfulness so i think these are these are these are analyzable in different ways the key thing is that when we are trying to develop virtues that are internal and abstract all that we can have are pointers towards that so we could say broadly speaking that these four are pointers towards humility that by doing things like this we can we can progress toward humility but that doesn't mean that these are these are inclusive of all the ways to be humble nor does this mean that these are that just by doing these we will be humble sometimes humility can take different forms so sometimes one might have humbly be assertive so we would say that that <clears throat> the last part of this verse in my understanding that is the key kirtaniya sada hari that our heart should be able to be free to glorify krishna so now that means the per humility we are not seeing it here as a, a virtue that is to be pursued as a end in itself humility is meant to take us to the end of uh, a constant glorification of krishna so constant glorification doesn't simply mean we are dancing and uh, singing but that our life and our energies are released are not fettered so so that we can glorify krishna and although sometimes we consider that certain people externally may be obstructing us from the glorification of krishna more often than not it is our own inner inner attitudes or inner emotions or inner reactions to others that distract us from glorifying krishna so if we keep that purpose of kirtaniya sada hari in mind and so that is the direct that is the direction in which we want to go now if we see a mountain okay you want to climb up that mountain you want to reach that mountain now if it's a forested path i can see okay there is a there is a small path this way there is a small path this way there is a small path this way so like that these four are are possible pathways are toward that direction of constant glorification of krishna so whichever now whichever pathway works for us that's what we can use Does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Hare Krishna, Chaitanya. Yes. Um, so you've mentioned a lot about humility and tolerance, and 
personally, I find that it is um, easier to be, for example, tolerant with devotees because they're already so kind and we know that they uh, perhaps are on in the path of purification and um, ha their hearts are set in the right place in Krishna. But sometimes I find that it is harder to be tolerant with, for example, non-spiritualists who have that exploitive mentality who just want to take advantage and just uh, really it's I win and you lose. And how do we find that fine balance of being tolerant and not being abused and mistreated, as you said, just like a twig, just, just blown away in the wind? Do we ever stand up for ourselves? And how do we know when to be tolerant and when to stand up or or, or, or do we not? I, I think I just, how do we know not to become uh, taken advantage of? Okay. This is an important question. So in general, rather than saying that it's easier to tolerate with devotees than with non-devotees, we could say that it's easier to be tolerating with people who are themselves tolerating. And it's, uh, <laughs> if somebody is intolerant, then being tolerant with them is, is much more difficult. So one way I, I see tolerance is that tolerance means to keep small things small so that we can focus on big things. The same Bhagavad Gita that talks about, am I audible to all of you? Yes, bro. Okay. So the same Bhagavad Gita that talks about tolerance, say 2.14 in the Bhagavad Gita talks about Tam Satiksha Swabharata. Tolerate. But that same, sec same Gita is also exhorting Arjuna to fight a war. Now we could say a war is definitely not an expression of tolerance. We, we could normally would consider tolerance and violence to be the opposite extremes. So why is there or why is there a call for tolerance within a book that is a call that at least in some ways looks like a call for ending nonviolence? So the point here is that the Bhagavad Gita is itself neither a call for tolerance itself, nor is it a call for violence itself. It is a call for transcendence. That one has to raise one's consciousness to the spiritual level. And especially because Arjuna was a king, so he was a ruler, so he had to create the social structures, oversee the maintenance of those structures that would help people to raise their consciousness to the spiritual level. And for that purpose, normally tolerance is the way forward because our tendency is to often get carried away with the uh, emotions generated by the events of the moment. You said this to me, I'll do this. This first thing happened, that thing happened. This thing happened, I'll do this now. So we tend to get swept away by that. And in that sense, we need to tolerate. So to but basically tolerance could be towards that, which is, which is not very important, but which seems very important at that particular time. Because of the movement, because of the, because of the pressure of the situation, tolerance can also be toward things that are unchangeable. Like the Bhagavad Gita says, tolerate the changes of heat and cold, yes, and tolerate pleasure and pain that they come along the way of life. So that's true. But then the Bhagavad Gita says that we all have a role to play. We all have a, a dharma to follow, and that is a big thing. So don't let circumstantial say pleasure or pain which may be too trivial to get distracted by or which may be just inevitable but don't let that distract us from that which we are meant to do so we have a dharma we have a we have a purpose in our life we have a duty we have a calling this can all refer to different things based on what the context is but the, the, we need to focus on the big things. So keep small things small so that we can focus on big things. So tolerance is in that sense, not never standing up for oneself. It is actually tolerance is 
knowing that everything is not worth fighting for so it doesn't mean nothing is worth fighting for it doesn't mean never standing up but it is that we get too caught up and our tendency is to uh, we could say just get reactive about things that are unworthy of a reaction or things that are unproductive in reacting to them they are they are in they are inconsequential or they are inevitable so in those two cases we we don't get ourselves distracted by them but there are things about which which are which are important for us about which we are responsible and we need to take a stand in those things does it answer your question yes and if you don't mind uh, that was very clear in, in essence there's a saying don't sweat the small stuff and so it's really letting the small things go but to stand up for the big things and the things that matter um but would, do you have any advice in for example dealing with perhaps the personalities um who have that more exploitative mentality how do we as devotees um deal with that or i guess handle or work with such um personalities yeah so if somebody is more exploitative how do we handle them yeah i think that's a challenge no doubt that usually if we approach all our interactions with people with a one size fit all formula then it is going to backfire so we need to krishna also says he is reciprocal yatha mam prapadyante tam tathaiva bhajam yaham that as all people surrender unto me i reciprocate accordingly so we also need to be reciprocal so the idea is whatever service we are doing we need to be able to do that service now reciprocal doesn't mean that other person is yelling about a small thing we also start yelling at that person that's not the idea of reciprocity here that means the depending reciprocity basically in this context means we understand how we can be effective in dealing with particular people so for example in the mahabharat war when arjuna is fighting with karna or bhima is fighting with duryodhana the duryodhana has inner animosity and does there are there are so he was the cause of the fight on the other hand there are there are bhishma and drona who had to fight but their fighting was circumstantial they were caught in the circumstances by which they had to fight against the pandavas so there was no inner animosity so if we look at the talks between the pandavas and bhishma and drona and the pandavas and duryodhana dushyasana there is a there is a significant difference in the way they are talking with each other because there is there is a sense of personal resentment or personal personal vendet personal animosity that is there for the kauravas which is not there for the other kuru elders so <clears throat> externally speaking they are fighting with everyone whoever is in front of them who is challenging them they have to fight but the inner disposition with which they are fighting is different it's individual so this might seem a little too subtle or abstract but the point is that <clears throat> if we keep our focus on getting a particular service done then how we go about doing that service so sometimes a person we approach them respectfully and they also talk cordially they say this is a, this is a problem here and we discuss how it can be resolved and then they resolve it and uh, we are able to get the service done on the other hand there could be somebody else with whom we have some purpose for interacting and they are constantly uh, passing snide comments or they just their words are filled with barbs now sometimes when if those barbs are just are just uh, 
they just want to get a rise out of us they just want to provoke us but if you can overlook them and we we do what it takes to get the things done so sometimes it might be that if some that if that person is uh, simply being uh, needlessly provocative then we we speak to them in a way that makes them aware that we also mean business but that doesn't necessarily mean threatening them or become stooping down to their level but the idea is that we need to keep our purpose in focus and there are many situations when uh, if somebody is exploitative we need to stand up for ourselves now standing up means we see vidura as this is a good example vidura was uh, constantly giving good advice to the pand to the kauravas to the trashtra and duryodhana and they were neglecting his advice and eventually after the pandavas were exiled then they were very angry and especially because they had attempt duryodhana had attempted to disrobe draupadi so there was a uh, attack of conscience that dhritarashtra had uh, it could it was actually more uh, attack of fear that also had some uh, rumbling of consciousness conscience within him and he said no this what has happened is terrible how can i rectify it so at that time vidura said that the only way you can rectify it is call the pandavas back and give their kingdom to him and he said <clears throat> punish duryodhana for this you know have him <clears throat> have him removed from all positions of power till he comes back to his senses and stops doing uh, stops doing things like these so this infuriated dhritarashtra and dhritarashtra said that you are always partial to the sons of pandu and you are always against my sons so he says i have no desire for your presence you can go wherever you like so at that time vidura left the the kuru kingdom and he went and joined the pandavas in the forest the pandavas were initially surprised and concerned but eventually they were happy to have vidura's association but all this happened uh, uh in the evening and night and the next morning the trashtra had a restless night where he couldn't sleep and then he he felt regretful you know vidura is my friend he is my sibling and i sh- i i want him with me because otherwise he was completely isolated you know, there was no one in his generation bishma was older to him duryodhana was younger to him so he sent a messenger to call back vidura and he and he did and vidura he was he trash not exactly you could say make a heartfelt apology but he he requested vidura to come back and vidura came back and vidura said that you know you know i desire the welfare of both your sons and pandu's sons but naturally because because the pandavas don't have a father so i am concerned about them also so anyway that time vidura came back but eventually when the war became inevitable and at that time duryodhana grievously insulted vidura and dhritarashtra remained silent then vidura walked away from there and he walked away because he he had no desire to fight for the kauravas against the pandavas and when they rejected him he also rejected them so we see that vidura was the same person but he had different approaches as long as he felt that he could be a part in minimizing the damage he knew that trust duryodhana had a had a malevolent had a malevolent nature and dhritarashtra had too much of a accommodating nature towards duryodhana so he wanted to be around to minimize the damage as much as he could but once he realized that the war was inevitable and he could do nothing 
to minimize the damage he did not he did not want to be a part of the team that caused or the side that caused was causing the damage he walked away but then later he came back and after the dhritarashtra had lost all his hope because all his sons had been killed then he came back and he strongly spoke to uh, dhritarashtra and he had dhritarashtra become renounced to renounce the world so the idea is that we have one purpose but we can have multiple approaches so even with even when they were exploit somebody is exploitative if there is a possibility for us to be there and minimize the damage we do that but once it becomes clear that you know we can't do anything rather by being here we are we are ourselves getting damaged or we are becoming a part of a thing that is causing damage to others and we can't do anything to minimize it then don't be a part of it and then later on he actually became a part of the opposite side or rather he became a part of the uh, side where which actively worked to get the trust and disentangled from the world so he had one purpose but there are different strategies based on time place circumstance does that make sense Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. So hi Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Um, <laughs> so you were just speaking about how um, sometimes you know we kind of have to be retreat or be humble in that way, and other times we need to be step forward and you know take action. And um, Shula Prabhupada was sometimes quoted for saying, you know, humility means being bold for Krishna. And, mm -hmm. and especially in this time right now where there's so many changes and so many opportunities for us as devotees to preach. And, you know, we have now we, we're using technology so much. How do we ensure that, you know, when we are engaging in activities online or you know through technology to preach that we um that it doesn't become all about us and it's not about you know kind of displaying our ego or or you know making all of our online activities about who we are especially with social media and things like that so are you saying that social media makes it difficult to be hum humble or tolerant or what what is the relationship between the two exactly how do we how do we prevent ourselves from um yes because often it, it can seem like you know when we're putting ourselves out there to preach you know with the goal of preaching that you know it's a lot of self promotion and so how oh, okay. do we be sure that we okay, don't I got the question yeah yeah <laughs> so social media often requires self promotion but then how can we be humble if we are also being self promoting well it's more a matter of what our purpose is so humility involves certain actions externally but more than that it involves the intentions internally so if Shri Prabhupada, when he came to India, and some of his disciples, some of his late disciples, had gone to Jaipur to get the deities of Krishna made over there, and while they were there, their sincere devotion that attracted many of the influential people of Jaipur, and through them, these late disciples of Shri Prabhupada arranged a pandal program for Prabhupada. and prabhupada was very delighted and proud of his disciples he says that they are organizing a big program for me that even his lady disciples can do extraordinary things so then eventually when prabhupada came there he saw the posters and the poster said but prabhupada and his foreign disciples and prabhupada said you know why just foreign disciples right there prabhupada and his american and british disciples now prabhupada actually had the posters changed over there now why american and british we say that actually in india britain was a former ruler and america was the land of opportunity land of dreams 
So those two countries at one level, we could say that they had much more uh, respect and appeal in the Indian eyes than just a generic word foreign. And Prabhupada's strategy had been that because Indians were enamored by the West. So he wanted to demonstrate how even Western people were exploring life's spiritual side and finding answers to spiritual questions in Indian, in the Indian wisdom tradition. And therefore Indians should also explore that same tradition, not neglect that. So now for his strategy to be effective, he had done his part. He had been gone to the West and courageously shared Krishna Bhakti and had been able to get, uh, had been able to inspire people to take up Bhakti. But now that had to be communicated. So Prabhupada was specific about that. That changed that. So is that self-promotion? It can seem like it. So similarly, on social media, there are certain forums where one needs to promote oneself. Because uh, it is, see, in, in normal life, we could say that uh, visibility is a function of growth that you know the, the bigger one is the more visible one is that is that is true but in social media growth is a function of visibility it works the other way also that the more visible you are only then you can people can connect and you can grow so if something is required for a particular service then doing that is is not necessarily against the principle of humility so what would what would be the against the principle of humility is where one is constantly seeking honor and recognition and fame. Say if somebody is on social media and they have a lot of followers, but uh, when you meet them, we can easily make out people who are who are you could say drunk with themselves. Drunk with themselves means if you're talking with them also. They will keep reminding, you know, I have this many followers and I have done this and, you know, this post got this much view and they're talking about themselves. And so it's that they are their mission. I could put it sub uh, succinctly is that they are their mission, not that their message is their mission. So if that means if they use whatever visibility they have to to promote the message that they want to share, then that is not self, that is not against the principle of humility. Because we want Krishna to be glorified. And if Krishna is to be glorified, Krishna, we need to ensure that the message of Krishna has the appropriate forums. If those forums are not there, then the glorification, then how will the glorification be done? And for that, but once you get those forums, if if we just start talking about ourselves, then that, that is a problem. But if we are you talking about ourselves so that the message gets, uh, gets heard more. So if our focus is on help providing others tools for raising their consciousness and Krishna's message is a very potent tool for raising people's consciousness. And for that purpose, we are using the visibility that we have. Then I don't think that's against the principles of humility. It is, it is, I, so two things, one is the intention of why we are doing it. And the other is, you now what do we actually use it for? So if, so you, you, we can very easily make out where there is a personality cult. That means it's more about or more or entirely about the person itself. And not so much about uh, the mission or the message. It is just about the person, person, person. Then it, it goes in the direction of the of being a personality cult and self-promotion without uh, divorce from any higher purpose. But if we are serving the purpose of sharing Krishna's message and mission, then if we have, that means apart one way to understand this is that apart from the present being the way we are present somebody is present in social media during the normal interactions are they down to earth are they constantly talking about themselves or are they expressing concern for others are they focused on the particular mission that they are trying to promote 
we consider these things then we will be able to get a better hold on humility despite the demands of social media does that make sense thank you yes it does thank you thank you um i also have another question in a regard to um Humility, the things you were just saying were, ma ma reminded me of um, something that we're often taught in Krishna consciousness, that what attracts Krishna most, what attracts his mercy most is our humility. And um, I, in my mind, or I often take that to mean, um, you know, if we're, if we're not humble and, and, you know, we have all these ideas, these speculations in our mind and we're not open to take on the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Um, and I just was wondering if, if that's accurate and also if what, if, you know, what else is there besides that that attracts Krishna, his mercy? What, is it, what else is it about humility that attracts him? So, Humility is what attracts Krishna. <coughs> In my understanding, it's a matter of a personal relationship with Krishna. And in every relationship, it is how, how much a person is concerned about the other person that, that determines the longevity of the relationship. If somebody is very self-obsessed, that they are con they are always talking about themselves and their feelings, they're not concerned about us. Then naturally, you know, we we may feel, depending on the particular modality of the relationship, we don't feel valued or even if we feel wanted, we feel more used than valued or cherished. So, at one level, <clears throat> you we see humility as something that frees our consciousness so that it's it's free from self-obsession, self-promotion, self-glorification and is avail, available for the other person. So, so that's, I would say, humility in one sense is required for any relationship. Now, specifically with respect to Krishna, there are many other factors coming into play that he is the supreme being and we need to be aware of his greatness. So when relating with God, there is his greatness and there is his there is his sweetness. And we need to be aware of both. Uh, however, the more we become aware of his greatness, the more it creates a sense of uh, humility, a sense of submissiveness. And then when we move forward toward Krishna's great sweetness, we can become more absorbed in him. So now, does humility itself attract Krishna? Yes, of course. It is especially that humility when it is expressed through service attitude or through service, then that attitude is what attracts Krishna. So if you consider the famous verse, 9.27, Krishna says that those who offer him patram pushpam phalam to yam yome bhaktya prayachati so now what is he saying over here that you don't need something big to offer to me but whatever you have if you offer it to me if it is offered with devotion I'll accept it so what Krishna wants is the devotion of the heart and humility ensures that our heart is not occupied with ourselves but it is uh, it is uh, rich with it has the space for devotion to be present and devotion to enrich the heart and then the devotion attracts krishna so i would say that it's a uh, not so much humility but it is bhakti it is devotion that attracts krishna you now devotion is one of the characteristics of uh, pure devotional services that even it, it, it even attracts krishna and Radharani, who is the personification of devotion, is the person is the person who attracts Krishna the most. 
so now is it her humility that attracts it is it is her devotion that attracts so it's a in my understanding yes humility is important but humility is what enables our heart to have the space for devotion to be manif to be present and to become manifest and it is devotion that attracts krishna so devotion is expressed through the desire to serve so devotion is is the feeling of love or affection and that feeling is expressed through service that's why if, if there is devotional service this devotion inside and the attitude of service outside then that is the that is the way we become connected with krishna krishna wants to reciprocate with us and that's how we move forward so humility when it is made into an end in itself there could be people who are humble but there they could be they could they are humble in their disposition but they might have no interest in god at all they might even be atheists but behaviorally they might be humble so is their humility in the sense that they they don't seek credit for themselves they want to share credit with others and you could have humility in an atheist would that attract krishna well krishna loves all living beings and krishna in that sense he is present in the hearts of the atheists and he loves them also but it is not their humility alone that will attract krishna it is primarily the service attitude or rather the devotional service attitude that attracts krishna and humility creates space for that does that address your question yes it does thank you thank you i had a um another question around humility and this is one that's just been on my mind for some time in the path of bhakti yoga we are told never take offense never take offense and it's uh, taking offense in one sense is the product of the false ego however what i never really understood was that when we actually read vedic literature we see that pure devotees actually have taken offense and in one sense they're supposed to be the model citizen or role devotee of who we're supposed to follow uh for example the four kumaras uh, taking offense when jai and vijay wouldn't let them into vaikuntha and cursing them and uh, even bima not wanting to lie down to the ground when the first brahmastra was released during kurukshetra just out of pride that he was a warrior and he wouldn't back down even though all the other warriors did uh and even just the leelas where bima out of pride and anger um got upset when there was uh, something in his way in the forest and later he realized it was the tail of hanuman aren't these all examples of just the false ego kicking in and taking offense um by pure devotees when they're supposed to be uh, model devotees for us to follow we're told not to take offense yet we see these pure devotees taking offense and perhaps not being humble do you mind explaining um that yeah so humility means to never seek revenge or never retaliate yeah i would say that see the pandavas fought a war but their primary purpose was not to take revenge the primary purpose was to establish dharma so i think that there is a difference between you did this to me so i'm going to do this to you and you did this to me and that was wrong and that needs to be stopped so we could say that what is the purpose of punishment see at the individual level as devotees it is best to be forgiving because in the world we all hurt each other in so many ways it's just inevitable so to have a uh, have a to live with a purpose of getting even that will get us at odds with ourselves we will lose ourselves in the quest for revenge so that's at a individual level it's good to be forgiving at the same time we don't exist simply as individuals we exist as parts of various wholes so we may be part of a of a community an organization and especially if we have some some institutional powers 
say for example um at an individual level if somebody does something to us we 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 may forgive them but then there is a whole department for justice if there are people who commit criminal activities and the police or the judges say let's forgive them all well if forgiveness or non retaliation would be were to be a were to be made into an absolute virtue then we would say that the the justice department the police department is all redundant let's just abolish it but they they do serve a important function so generally when punishment is given for some particular wrong or action especially some grievous wrong action then it serves three distinct purposes first is deterrence you know it sets an example for other people that if you do this there are consequences don't do this so society needs to know that actions have consequences secondly it also serves a purpose of uh, so it's deter deterring people in general from doing the same thing second is it also curbing that person from doing the same thing again i if a person can do something wrong and get away with it and they get away with once now with themselves not just once twice thrice but repeatedly then that's dangerous so that has to be taken care of and thirdly we also take the pain of that person seriously that's why the whole idea of instead of using the word revenge we could say we could use the word compensation now if if a thief has stolen say a million dollars from someone and would we just say that just just forgive it no million dollars is a big thing and uh, you have to if you have, if you have stolen that you will have to compensate for that so you said there can be compensation at a financial level and uh, that compensation indicates that we take that the, we acknowledge the seriousness of the loss that the person has suffered so similarly we although we cannot quantify in financial terms there could be physical pain or emotional pain that has been inflicted on someone and that has to be taken seriously so now at a when say a devotee is at the individual level dealing with others it's best to just forgive and move on with life but if forgiveness or just non retaliation is made into the supreme virtue then it can become a problem then it can facilitate people with parasitic or predatory motives if they are there they can grab power and they can abuse people through that power so there has to be a system of administration and that system of administration they can't be uncritically forgiving so the difference between what arjuna wanted that i will not fight the war and that was a fair enough point but he that is a brahmanical virtue that if a person is individually insulted okay forgive them but arjuna was not 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 a brahman he was a kshatriya he was he, may, he had a responsibility to maintain order in society and if he didn't do that what would happen duryodhana had been so brazen that he had attempted to disrupt draupadi in public and if he had unchallenged untrammeled power he would do similar heinous things more and more and that would be that would be disastrous for society so to stop duryodhana from doing those things to stop and to stop others from thinking that they could also do things like duryodhana did and get away with them there had to be some amount of discipline required so i think there's a difference between a brahmanical mode of acting and a kshatriya mode of acting brahmanical mode of acting is non retaliation forgiveness as you have said 
and as devotees in general in our inter interactions we act in the mode of goodness and we are brahmanical in that sense but uh, otherwise we are also uh, if if somebody is in a kshatriya role that means they are in administrative position they have responsibilities uh, in that in that sense for the taking care of a broader community then they have to also do what it takes to protect that community so among the third of three factors taking a, ensuring that others don't imitate uh, ensuring that the same person the person doesn't continue or worsen and third is take the pain of the victim seriously uh, we might in non forgiving or in in non retaliating or forgiving we can wave off the third thing not take the pain seriously or rather just okay it happened but i am ready to move ahead with it but the first and second need to be taken seriously otherwise we can't move ahead with life uh, in a way that would be healthy in the long run for the building of a community does it address your question yes thank you so much thank you gaur kumar prabhu you have any questions i think you are on the you are on the mute so thank you so much chaitanya shri prabhu i think um, most of the questions were very nicely answered i just want to summarize the section on humility before we move to the next section so you gave two wonderful definitions of humility so you said humility should lead us to the glorification of krishna that is the trinada piso niche in our verse so that was very powerful and all the examples that you gave actually fell into that particular definition the other definition that you gave is humility is not to let our ego come in the way of our mission mm. so that was also so these two definitions actually kind of solved all the other issues that we all asked and then in terms of practical applications you mentioned that keep small things small overlook provocations uh, have forgiveness in your heart like keep forgiving people stand up for yourselves and when it comes to social media we can understand if they are their mission and krishna is not their mission then that is not humility so thank you so much for a comprehensive view of uh, humility now i just want to talk about the other section on uh, feel good feel bad so let's talk about one simple example of arjuna so arjuna told uh, so krishna told arjuna to fight but the same krishna told uddhava to renounce and in both cases they both felt good but told many times to fight krishna told whom not to fight krishna told arjuna to fight and krishna told uddhava to renounce okay yeah so in both cases both arjuna and uddhava felt good by krishna's advice and that was of course krishna but when we go and do our outreach we always have this problem sometimes we tend towards purification and sometimes we tend towards affirmations we say that no you have to get purified or sometimes we say no it's okay whatever you're doing is fine uh, sometimes so this conflict always exists sometimes we just focus on saying that change your actions and sometimes we say just change your thinking in fact most self help tools most self help uh, talks these days they just focus on change your thinking but don't worry about your actions that is in our movement we focus on change your actions and uh, don't worry, it doesn't matter about your thinking so okay. again there is this uh, dichotomy so in the next section of our discussion if we can talk more about should we feel good should we feel bad about these things how do we balance it because sometimes when somebody says it is necessary to say that you should get purified and that that person takes it as a good thing he feels good but the same advice if you give it to another person and say that you just have to get purified then that person might feel bad so yeah, i think yeah so how do we know when to say what and uh, when to feel good when to feel bad or spirituality yeah. beyond this and so on so that's the next this section this is actually a big subject and i i want i suspect that we might need to have a separate discussion for this Okay. that you mean discussion humility went quite far but i'll just make maybe i'll address the specific issue that you raised 
and then depending on if how many more questions are there we could decide whether we want to have a separate session so with respect to our practice of spirituality in our daily life you know is sometimes we may feel good sometimes we may feel bad and in different situations different directions are given so how are these to be reconciled well i would say two three different things are going on over here first is that the it's like i find it often very helpful to consider the mind to be like the body it is a domain of reality in itself at the level of the body if somebody's sole purpose is to be comfortable or even the sole purpose is to be safe now safety is important and certainly we don't want to trivialize uh, uh, be casual about safety but somebody could argue that you know, just going out in a car on a street increases the probability of an accident as compared to staying at home yeah so that doesn't mean one should always stay at home safety is important or if we forward more than safety if you safety is the basic and we could say it's important but more than that is comfort now physical comfort is we, nobody in itself wants to be uncomfortable but sometimes Uh, to grow physically we need to be ready to put ourselves in some kind of discomfort so if somebody wants to be healthier they need to do some exercises and doing exercise itself is not always comfortable so just as there is there is the comfort of the body there is the discomfort of the body it's a problem when both become ends in themselves if somebody thinks comfort is the only end that they they seek in their lives then then their life will soon become meaningless because often doing something meaningful doing something worthwhile requires taking some amount of discomfort but on the other hand if somebody makes discomfort itself a virtue just see how how much discomfort i am putting myself in so well to make yourself uncomfortable is not the purpose of life so it is that we need to have something worthwhile to do and while doing that some worth some worthwhile thing we try to avoid discomfort as much as possible but that doesn't mean that we have to avoid comfort also the idea is that the body needs certain level of comfort and as much as possible we create a comfortable situation but creating a comfortable situation is not the purpose of life the purpose is that okay, a physically comfortable situation is meant to be meant to help us focus on a purposeful life the same approach we can have toward our emotions also that on an average we don't want to have disturbing emotions within us we don't like to feel worried we don't like to feel angry we don't like to feel uh, um, feel confused there are various kinds of emotions which make us feel bad at the same time if we want to do anything meaningful in our lives it means investing ourselves in something that is not entirely in our control and as soon as we invest ourselves in something that is not entirely in our control all these emotions will come up sometimes when something important for us is going wrong there will be fear that if sometimes we don't know what to do about a particular situation there will be anxiety there will be confusion or other and sometimes when something goes the opposite of way we want there might be resentment there might be anger so if one makes it the goal of their life to avoid these things then they will never be able to do anything life involves confronting uncomfortable emotions also but we don't make cultivating uncomfortable emotions the goal of one's life 
it's that for doing something meaningful if sometimes some uncomfortable emotions have to be confronted that's fine so say for example with sort of spirituality one extreme of spirituality as you mentioned is that we just want to feel good about ourselves and that's why feeling good about ourselves means just have the thoughts about have positive uplifting thoughts so for example some people in the name of affirmations they may say i am strong i am powerful i i can i can do whatever i set my mind on i have all the abilities that i need but this kind of this kind of affirmative uh, affirmations uh, uh, could be healthier than just uh, if our mind is constantly having a negative script you are worthless you will never amount to anything so that's so the second kind is is def- it could be damaging the first kind could be uh, beneficial but if somebody gets caught only in affirmation and then there is no action following that affirmation and there is no meaningful action no purposeful action so then that is what is the point of all that positive thoughts if there is no proper actions that are there so we don't make in spiritual life for spiritual growth there are times when our the bubble of our ego needs to be burst we if we are too full of ourselves we need to get out of ourselves but at the same time spiritual life is not so much about feeling good or is it about feeling bad it is about feeling a reality bigger than ourselves in fact feeling the ultimate reality so we want to connect with krishna and in that sense we want our feelings to be free from ourselves so if there is too much uh, that the two self congratulatory and attitude then our feelings are caught in congratulating ourselves and then they are not available for focusing on krishna on connecting with krishna on serving krishna on thinking about krishna at a basic level so we don't want that self congratulatory attitude on the other hand if there is a self condemnatory attitude if i'm constantly beating myself up Uh, then also my emotions are caught in myself and then also i will not be able to focus on krishna so in that sense we need to have a balance that if we again if we keep the purpose in mind so i want to have positive thoughts so that there are some positive actions that i i am able to do something worthwhile something meaningful and so we don't make a fetish of a uh, feel good or of feel bad one major problem with spirituality as it is seen in the mainstream world is that spirituality is seen more as a shock absorber than as a life transformer or a, more specifically a purpose or a goal transformer so i want to do what i want to do and while i am doing what i want to do i want to feel good about myself also so that is a very utilitarian understanding of spirituality where we see it as a means to feel good but that that's not that that's a very we could say a diluted or distorted and almost a distorted understanding of spirituality spirituality is much much more so spirituality is meant to be a goal transformer it reveals a higher reality to us a uh, higher reality of who we are what the nature of the world is what we are meant to do and it transforms that goal and once it transforms the vision of our world transforms our goal and then when we are pursuing bigger things in our life then sometimes we may feel bad because there are challenges sometimes we may feel good but that higher purpose is what consumes us that is what absorbs us and that's the essence of spirituality Does it address the question? Yes, Prof. Very well. Do any of you have any a quick question before we summarize and end? Maybe just one quick question. Uh, okay, just one minute. So uh, before, yeah. before we move forward, okay, how many of you have questions on this? Based on that, we'll decide whether to take it today or have another session on this. I do. So. 
I'm not sure about others. I think uh, there are four more. Like each one has one question. I guess. Okay. I'm happy to wait for it to be a bit of discussion, given that it is seems to be so broad. Um, yeah. I, I do have a couple questions, but I'm happy to wait if Jif wants to ask his last question, and we hold off to another time. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. Yes, I agree. Let's have a separate session then. We can okay. discuss in detail about that. So okay. thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prabhu Ji. Thank you so very much for taking the time with us. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>